Welcome to this fourth episode here at NYU Artificial Intelligence course, Spring 24 edition, 11 a.m. New York City Live. Uh, we're going to be uh, starting today uh, with a very tricky, very tricky slide. Uh, it took me a lot of time. Actually, I, I made it and then I destroyed it. I made a different one. Um, about the performance evaluation of binary classifiers. Every single time, I swear, I have to figure out these words, like I have to figure out how to compute one of the other uh, two performance metric. I need to double check because I forget every time. So if you get confused, it's okay. I used to get confused, but since I'm teaching, I'm no longer getting confused, right? That's how it works. Every time I have to teach something, I actually understand it finally. <laughs> Uh, performance metric for a binary classifier, okay? We're going to be talking about four different metrics. One is going to be accuracy. You might be already familiar with that. We're going to be introducing precision. We're going to be introducing recall. And we're going to be seeing how to combine these two with a harmonic mean in the F measure. Okay. Be ready. Let's get started. Let's try to not get lost. I, I, I really, I really know it's going to be painful, but I try my best, okay, to make it as painless as possible. But I cannot do magic. We have this specific situation at hand. We have some positive samples here, represented as these uh, dots on the left hand side of the screen, and then we have some negative samples. Okay, the the big chunks, the one with the like donuts. So, for example, we could think about this as being the spam classification uh, case where we have a few spam emails on the left hand side, the full dots, and then the majority of the donuts are instead ham, right? The, the good males. Then we're going to be training our naive base classifier and we identify some of these as being spam. So, this big circle here I just drew is my prediction. These are the things I managed to detect. So as you can see, there are now four different areas in this picture. Let's figure out what each of these are. The first one is going to be the first left hand side semicircle. Those are the true positive. What does it mean? So these are the spam emails I managed to correctly identify. Among everything I have identified as spam, the one in green are the actual correct spam messages, okay? So if I open the spam box, the spam folder, I will find uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spam emails. Unfortunately, there are actually two emails uh, that uh, Ernie wrote, but they fell into spam, I don't know why. So there were actually two good emails in the spam folder, and that's not good. And these are called the false positive. I thought they were positive. I thought these were spam, but they are not. If you consider uh, Ernie's emails as not being spam, which is that's what we are going to be doing today. OK, all right. Uh, now we have more uh, spaces to cover. Uh, we have this big chunk over here where you have the majority of the donuts, which are lying outside my circle. And so these are correctly identified non-spam, okay? Because if the things inside a circle, I predict them as being spam, the things that are outside are not spam. And therefore, these are the true negatives, meaning they are the negatives that are actually correctly identified. And then finally, in the last part, is going to be the last block, which is going to be the spam I missed that I got in the main mailbox. And so these are the false negatives. I considered them as being ham because they are outside my circle. But unfortunately, those are full dots. Therefore, they are spam. So far, does it make sense? You understand? Tell me if you don't understand. You don't have to type yes, because otherwise there is an infinite length of yeses. No, if you don't understand, tell me. No, no, yes. I don't understand. No one says no. OK, everyone says yes. Don't say yes, because it's too many of you understanding. Good. OK. All right. So now we're going to be coming up with these metrics, OK, based on these four uh, specific shapes we introduced. So the first one, which is, again, easy, easy, the thing we might already be familiar, which is the accuracy. Accuracy is the total uh, number of correct predictions, meaning all the spam and all the ham that was correctly identified by my model. 
divided by the entirety of the uh, data points, which is the whole big box. Okay, so you can see there is a problem here. Uh, let's say my circle shrinks to zero, and then I have a very, 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 very large uh, set of good emails, right? So let's say I have one spam every 100 emails I receive. So what is the accuracy of a classifier that classifies everything as being good? How much? If I get one email, yeah, correct, right? So the, the classifier that says everything is ham, everything is good, is going to be getting an accuracy of 99%. And this is actually the baseline, right? This is a stupid classifier. There's no machine learning. There's nothing <laughs> learning here. It's just really a uh, fixed output. Okay. So therefore, we had to introduce these new metrics. Okay, get ready. The first one is called precision. Precision is the fraction of my predictions that is actually correct. Okay. So in, in, in pictures here, it's going to be the green uh, semicircle divided by the entirety of the circle, okay? So what is my precision in this case? In this case, my precision is equal, do we know? Can we count? 80%, there you go, yes. Okay, that's good. Uh, on the other side, we're gonna be introducing the last metric, which is going to be the recall. The recall tells us among all the positive samples among all the spam, how many did I catch, okay? In this case, what is this number? What is my recall? Can you count? Uh, 21, no, 20, I, ouch. Did I put 21 dots? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Ah, okay, there should have been 20, so my bad. <laughs> I, okay, fine. I don't know. I, I thought I, can't, I I put 20 dots in total. Okay, I it was meant to be 40%. Okay, all right. So let me try to uh, explain to you how this works with analogy, okay? So imagine, I'm actually going to read this one because I just wrote it down. Imagine you're a detective investigating a case, okay? And your goal is to catch all the criminals, the positives, uh, involved in a series of robberies. And you have this list of the suspects you're investigating. The precision, again, this term here on the left, tells you how many of the identified suspects are actual criminals. So you identify 10 suspects as criminals, and then you were correct about eight of them. So your precision would be 80%. On the other case, the recall tells you how many of the actual criminals you managed to catch. Uh, suppose there were actually 20 criminals, not 21, <laughs> involved in the robberies, but you only managed to catch eight of them. Your recall would be eight out of 20 or 40%. I hope it makes sense. I already spent so much time making this slide. <laughs> All right, despite having uh, too many dots, well, hold on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, uh, 12, 13, down. Yes, I, I, I fuck it up. <laughs> okay, I will remove the dot before sharing this, this slide with you. Very good. Okay, so this is not how usually people teach these things and uh, the, how you compute these things. So usually people show you this slide, which is gonna be very daunting. So this is called the confusion matrix. The confusion matrix has the predictions on the left-hand side. Therefore, you can have the uh, what I predict as being positive and what I predict being negative. So here I have the circle on the first row. And then the one minus, like square minus the circle is gonna be the second row. On the top part, instead I have the labels, the label positive would be the left side of the drawing as we saw before. And then the label negative would be the right side of the drawing. So here you have all the four combination. If I have my circle and is on the left hand side, it's true positive. If it's inside the circle, but it's on the right hand side, then it's false positive. Again, positive means you are inside the prediction, the circle. The second part would be predicted negative, the square minus the circle. If you're on the left-hand side, you're wrong because those are false negatives because those actually were uh, your spam emails or your criminals. And instead, the correct part would be the uh, part of the box on the right-hand side uh, excluded the circumference, right? Which is the true negatives. 
Okay. So precision again, once more, is going to be the fraction of my circle, right? This is the first row is, is my circle, my prediction is the fraction of my circle. That is the sum of the two items over here. Uh, that is actually correct. So true positive divided by true positive and false positive. Again, reading these names makes no sense to me. But remembering the circle makes much more sense to me. Whereas on the other side, this column is the left side column, which is all the criminals or the spam. And the recall tells you how many of the total amount of criminals or total amount of spam I actually managed to catch. Okay. Finally, the accuracy down here in the corner is going to be the summation of the true positive and these true negatives, which are usually much, much, much larger for skew uh, problems like spam detection or criminal <laughs> catching. And you have that this term is going to be like predominant. Uh, and therefore, this accuracy may not tell you anything. Like we said before, it's going to give you 99%, even though you have like a, uh, you say everyone is a good. There are no criminals. Okay. <laughs> No, that's bad. No, there are criminals. You should catch the criminals if you're an investigator. Anyway, anyway, so definitions. We had this accuracy is the fraction of correctly predicted observations. Uh, precision is the fraction of positive predictions that are correct. And recall is a fraction of positive labels that are correctly identified. On the bottom side, you see also this precision and recall put emphasis true positive, right? In this part here. Uh, which means what we are looking for, the spam. All right. Questions? I, I know that, that was a lot, but I gave you the, I'll give you the slide and, and you can look at this stuff once again afterwards. All right. So now we had these two terms, uh, pre precision recall. There is a way to put them together. So F measure, F measure allows us to compute some sort of trade-off between the two items here, the P, the precision, and the R recall. Will all these three properties be large for a skew problem? No, you can decide to move one side the other. So usually it's a trade-off problem. If you try to get one high, the other one goes down. If you try to get one high, the other one goes down. So it, you have to decide where do you want to put yourself? Mostly based on the uh, problem you have at hand. So it's not that you can just find, uh, oh, this is the average. Okay, well, that's what we're gonna be doing here, uh, harmonic average, but you can decide how to, which one to wait more, okay? Where you want to put yourself based on your application. I'll tell you an example in a second. So this F beta score, which has this kind of funny expression here, is going to be one plus beta square. And then the product of precision recall divided by beta square times the precision plus the recall. I'll tell you later where this comes from. Let's go through this first. Uh, if beta is large, this expression will favor recall. So, for example, when you have a medical diagnosis, if you might have a very rare, unfortunately, let's say we don't, but if someone has a very rare uh, disease, not catching it, it's very bad, right? So for, for medical diagnosis, missing a positive is way more critical than falsely identify a negative case. This is actually the case for um, breast cancer uh, detection, where if you get a positive uh, result means usually nothing. You just do a second test, it's going to be negative. But it's better to catch something uh, that can have their their, their consequences. Their, their, how do you spell? I don't know how to pronounce this word. Uh, very bad consequences. Then it's better to catch something that is really relevant for your health than not catching it. Okay. So this is why or when we may want to favor uh, recall, right? Having a large beta. On the other side, beta small, the F score favors the precision. When is actually useful this? For example, falsely classifying a legitimate email, like I told you before, right? If I get spam folder, uh, Ernie emails, then I get into trouble, right? Or if I get the. <laughs> The, the head of the department emails there, like, let's say it never happened. Uh, yeah, you get into trouble, right? Because I should have replied on something that, oh, I didn't see because it went somewhere else, right? And so in this case, uh, getting some false positives, it's bad, okay? 
All right, sweet. So where is this a question coming from? First of all, uh, we in the homework I, I, I wrote, I'm going to be releasing this tonight. Uh, I'll ask you just, just to compute this F1 score, which is just the, again, the mean of the two things, the harmonic mean. Uh, is the goal for our classifier to maximize the F score? So no, the F score is the score you report, right? Whenever you have a classifier, I'd like to know how it performs. And sometimes uh, if the uh, classes are balanced, then the accuracy is a fine metric to evaluate your classifier. But now if you, I have multiple classifiers and I have skewed data and I do a binary classification, then comparing accuracies might be completely useless. Okay. And in this case, we may want to compare F scores to figure out which one gives us the best compromise between the precision recall. So that, that's how I do model selection. If I have multiple models and they, each of them have different scores, I can, okay, I can choose a model that has the highest F score given that I chose beta according to my specific problem at hand. Um, given that less than one favors precision and greater than one favors recall, is taking the F measure with beta equal one standard? No. As I show you here in gray, it really depends on what you actually are working on. If you're working on medical diagnosis, taking beta smaller than one is very bad, right? Really, you don't want to say someone, oh, you're fine, and then <laughs> the, the, turns out they are not fine, right? That, that's very bad. You can't really take beta equal one. So it depends on your specific application, okay? Uh, again, in assignments, it doesn't matter. But in the real world case, yeah, it does actually matter, okay? All right. Uh, so telling you where this comes from, just such that you don't uh, think this comes from the, I don't know, from my imagination. Uh, this comes from the harmonic mean of P and R. The harmonic mean is going to be the one over the sum of one over P plus one over R scaled by uh, coefficient and one minus the coefficient. Okay. And then if you set beta square equal one minus alpha over alpha, then you're going to get this equation over here. Again, doesn't really matter. It's just a way to uh, take the mean of the two things, but putting more weight in the smallest one. Okay, so it's kind of a mean. All right, so this actually went through uh, nice, easier than expected. And now we can move forward, if there are no questions, to actually learning weights. Huh, what are the weights? It's the same as the parameter for a probabilistic model, but for a Neural model. Oh, let's start talking about neurons. Yay. <laughs> okay, I'm the only one excited here, I see. <laughs> so this is, again, uh, slides coming from my co-worker, uh, Peter, in, uh, in Berkeley. It's the last set of deck we're going to be using uh, from them. Everything else is going to come from me. But these are, again, uh, these slides about the AI course I never thought. So that's why uh, I'm, I'm borrowing these slides. I, I've been modifying them a lot, right? Anyway, artificial intelligence, perceptron, and logistic regression eventually. Uh, let's figure out what is a linear classifier. We're going to be doing the following. We're going to have our X on the uh, left-hand side. We're going to be extracting some feature vector F out of our data point X. And then we're going to be making some prediction. I'm going to call it uh, Y tilde or Y hat, actually. So, for example, we can have the uh, this email. Hello, do you want free printer cartridges? Why pay more when you can? <laughs> okay, whatever, right? Uh, then from that email, we extract a set of uh, values in this case. Uh, for example, your name, number of times we counted three. If my name appears, if there are misspellings, how many misspellings, if it's from a friend, so it's going to be a Boolean. So given that we extracted these features, you have to write a program to extract these features, then we're going to be outputting either uh, the, the fact that it's a spam or a ham. Uh, the other example we also saw before was this, where we have a bunch of pixels on the left-hand side, where basically this feature vector could be representing the fact that the pixel 712 or 713 are either on or off, or perhaps how many loops we can count in the picture. So these are, again, features that I build on top of my input. And our classifier output prediction is supposed to say, in this case, this is uh, two. All right. We're going to be trying to do this today uh, by somehow 
very loosely imitating a human neuron. So a human neuron has uh, dendrites that are connections uh, from where it gets its input. So these dendrites are basically acquiring information from uh, something else. Synapses are the point where another tail of another neuron is connected to my dendrite. Uh, you have the nucleus here, which is actually uh, getting keeping the, <laughs> the, the, the cell alive. Uh, this is called the soma or the body cell. And the axon is going to be basically my tail, which is going to be very, very long. And the entirety of these tails is what makes the uh, white matter in your brain. Whereas the gray matter is going to be basically where you find the uh, nuclei, right? These black things. And again, these are going to be my axon. Then these axon arborize. Arborize means it makes like a tree branch, right? Branches. And then it's going to be making some synapses with other, um, other neurons. Okay, small biological <laughs> uh, part. So we're going to be trying to make a very rough simplification with our network. Uh, these actually are the myelin, myelinic. Uh, this actually uh, allows to the, the signal to propagate for further distance. It's completely unrelated, but these are just cute uh, visualization. Anyway, don't touch. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm silly. Okay, so how are we going to be using uh, this mathematical model? The inputs that I show you in the dendrites, right here. So the inputs are going to be the feature values, the values that we extracted from our input X before. So that vector F. Each feature has a weight. So we are going to be weighting each component of the feature vector. And then we're going to be summing all those values. And this stuff is going to give us the activation of the neuron. How does actually a neuron work? So a normal neuron, like a brain neuron, if the sum of the inputs is going to be higher than a specific voltage, then the neuron is going to start firing. If you are below that specific uh, threshold, then the neuron is like dead. It doesn't say anything. And so there is basically a summation module. And then if the sum is larger than a threshold, then this stuff is actually activated. Otherwise, it's not. So uh, neurons in our brains kind of we can say they are binary they are either on they're firing or they are not firing okay first approximation okay <laughs> i teach you biology next time if you want anyway so mathematics back to our <laughs> to our stuff our activation our linear activation following this weight w uh, is going to be the summation of all these features in our uh, in our input x multiply weighted by uh, its corresponding weight, Wn, okay? So how many features, element, do I have? Anyone following? For my X, capital N, yeah? Okay, okay. So lowercase n goes from 1 to capital N, right? So I have capital N distinct features for my input X. And then each feature is going to be weighted by this weight coefficient. That's why uh, this summation is called a weighted sum. Okay, a weighted sum basically sums all these features element with a weight there. I also wrote this in a more compact way. Are you familiar with this right side formulation? Yes, no? Yeah, so this is the okay, this is the inner product, right? So I took this set of scalar values into a vector. I flip it, I, I took the transpose, and then I do inner product, a row times column here between these two things, which is exactly what this equation here on the left hand side says, but this is more compact, and more convenient. And then I will actually drop this X because we know that this F is a function of X, but then given that I have the X, I already have the F, right? So I can simply also forget this is a function, I can just consider the value the function has. Question. What is the output of this operation? This is a vector. This is a vector. If I multiply these two things together, do I get what, what do I get? A scalar. Okay, very good. Because also here we sum just a bunch of scalars, right? Okay, good. All right. So if the linear activation is positive, my system will output a plus one. If my uh, activation is negative, then my system will output a negative one. So I'm going to have here my feature one is going to be weighted by weight uh, one. I have feature two is going to be weighted by a much smaller weight two. 
I have a feature three, it's going to be weighted by a large, very big weight three. What about how can I ignore a feature, for example? Okay, weights. Okay, very good. Are you following? Good. So I have these uh, features weighted by a factor, and then I sum them up. And then I check whether it's going to be larger than zero, and then I output the corresponding weight tilde. Okay, good. All right, so the weights, binary case, we're going to start easy. Compare features to a weight vector. Later on, we're going to see how to move to the multi-class case. So learning, we're going to be figuring out the weight vector from examples. So in this case, I have my weight vector here. For example, this weight vector has a four for the number of times I see the word free. I have a negative one for my your name. So if I see my name, it's likely not to be, maybe we can read something here. It's likely not to be a, a spam email. Uh, if there are misspelling, there's a one here. If it's from my friend, it might like much likely not be uh, a spam. Okay. Anyway, so there are some numbers inside the weight. These are the weighting coefficients. Uh, and then this is going to be my feature for x1, uh, the x1 input. So in this case, I see two times the word free. There is no my name. There are two misspells. So what is the inner product of these two things, positive or negative? Positive, very good. And so what does our system say? What did we say our system is supposed to say? If the inner product is positive, then we output plus one, right? Which means, oh, this is spam. Okay, I think we understand. Positive inner product means positive prediction, cool. Then we have this other feature for this other input data point. For example, there are no instances of the word free. There is my name. There is just one word misspelled, and then it's for my friend. How about this case? Is the inner product positive or negative? Negative minus one. Thank you, Josh, and you got it right. Sweet. All right, so decision rule. Let, let's figure out what is this thing. Um, in the space of feature vectors, examples are points. Okay, so examples like the features are points. So in this case, I have my vector of weights, uh, which is in two dimensions here, such that I can actually draw it on a screen. Uh, we have two components has free and has money. Okay, this vector here has a magnitude four horizontally and two in the uh, altitude. A weight vector is a hyperplane. So you can think about this weight vector as having this specific. Uh, hyperplane where we have that the inner product with any other point is equal to zero, right? So if I take all the points along this direction, you're going to have that the inner product with any of these back points here and this guy here is going to be zero. Everyone keeps typing minus one. Uh, there is a time limit on the answers. We don't see those late answers. <laughs> anyway, uh, sure. So one side corresponds to uh, prediction plus one. Okay. If you are on the positive side, it's going to be plus one. If you are on the other side, it's going to be negative one. And so basically, every can you ignore the hyperplane again? Can you can you ignore the hyperplane again? What do you mean? Can I ignore? Oh, I can explain for sure. I cannot speak ignore it. Uh, sure. So the, the, we we check here the the question here. Remember, we said that if the inner product is positive, then my model will say that the uh, output is a plus one. OK, if the inner product is negative, then the output is negative one. So far, uh, way ye makes sense. Yeah, OK, sweet. So where is the location where we actually decide whether it is positive or negative? If the inner product is actually zero, then you have the locations uh, that is separating the plus ones from the minus one. You see this, right? If it's larger than zero, it's going to be positive. Okay, it actually works even double meaning. If it's lower than zero, right, the inner product is lower than zero, then we say it's negative. If it is equal to zero, then it's the location where it separates the two uh, spaces. Does my English make sense? I, I fear my English is broken. So I have my vector, okay? 
we said if the points are happening here, the inner product is what is the how much is the inner product? Is positive or negative if my point is here? You can say I don't understand the question. So let me draw. Let's say my my feature is over here. Okay, this is my feature F. My feature over here. Yeah, okay, no, not everyone typing. I'm talking to Wei Yi. Stop typing. <laughs> I can't see anymore what's going on. So if my vector is over here and I take the inner product, the, the angle is uh, less than 90. Therefore, I have a positive inner product. Okay. On the other side, if I have a vector that is on the other side here, more than 90, this one is going to be uh, instead negative, right? So where is the location that is separating the blue guys from the red guys? So I should have used green, but okay. The location is going to be this here. This is the location where the inner product is actually equal to zero. And so this one can be thought as a decision boundary where we make the decision whether it is positive or negative. Wei, does it make sense or no? I lost you. Okay, good. All right, moving forward. Sweet. So we're going to be considering basically every hyperplane as the weight or every weight as being the hyperplane. They are mutually defined one by the other. Okay. But the weight, the weight vector also has a magnitude, whereas this hyperplane has only the direction. All right. So one side is the plus one, the blue guy. The other side is going to be the negative one. Cool. And so we basically have that this um, perceptron has these decision boundaries implemented by the orthogonality with respect to the vector, which is telling me how to separate the positive classes to the negative classes. On one side, you're going to get the positive things. Inner product is uh, larger than zero. You have positive prediction. Inner product negative than zero, you have negative thing. Okay. So now you can see that uh, if I only have two variables, this uh, hyperplane is actually always hinged at zero. Then I can add a additional term here, this bias term, which allows me to move this thing up and down. So if before I was asking free and money, this, this smaller vector, free, free and money, uh, inner product with another feature larger than zero. Now I can, it can be expressed as this one larger than plus three. And that's why it shows you here, if this inner product is larger than three, then it's going to be considered spam. Otherwise, if it's lower than three, it's going to be considered minus one. So how do we deal with this bias? In the feature vector, my first element of every feature vector is going to be always set to one. OK, so back to the feature vectors, we're going to be adding one more item here in my feature for each uh, feature vector for every every input. Uh, regardless, my first item is going to be bias plus one bias plus one. And then my weight is going to have a, this, a, this additional bias, which allows me to choose how to move up and down this uh, decision boundary. Without the bias, I cannot move this thing up and down. So now I can separate points that are at this location, no longer. They don't have to be centered in the origin. Make sense? Yes? No? I lost you. You're still here. Can you explain again why the plane is move over? Yes, I can explain again. So for example, I may have F equal to three. What is going to be the inner product between W and F? It's going to be two times four, eight, plus three times two, six, eight plus six. Are we following 14, right? All right. So is 14 larger than zero? Yes. Now maybe 14 is too large of a number. So maybe I would like to check whether this number is larger than 10. How can we do that? So in the other case, uh, I have my F is going to be the same F, but then we have this additional term, right? We have this one and two and three, right? I think I, I typed before. So in this case, if we do uh, the multiplication, you're going to be getting minus three plus 14, right? Larger than zero. But now we can actually flip it. It becomes 14 
larger than three, right? Which is actually still true. So now you have this different equation, right? So before we were checking whether 14 was larger than zero. Now I'm actually checking if 14 is actually larger than three. So I basically move where this line happened. If you were counting this length along this line, you have to check if you are on the right hand side. Okay. And so by having this additional minus three, which goes on the other side, allows you to basically shrink the length of this thing that was 14 before. And now it's going to be 11. Okay. If this first term was, I don't know, uh, 15, right? If this was minus 15, basically we move this bar up, up above here. Okay. And now, although 14 was larger than zero, but now it's going to be the new case is going to be 14 larger than 15. And in this case, it's not true. And therefore, we're going to be uh, classified as ham. Okay. Who asked this question? Uh, Dennis, does it make sense? I see. I think I got confused because the plane doesn't intersect at three on the x axis. No, it doesn't. The, the three is going to be uh, this length here. The, that's correct, right? Because you the negative number goes on the other side, right? Okay. All right, so let's figure out now how to learn these weights. Weight updates. How do we learn these things? Be ready. <laughs> so we start with these weights equals zero. First question for the one of you that are actually paying attention to my notation. Uh, why did I type here weights and zero in bold? Someone can tell, maybe. If you don't, it's okay. But just because they are vectors. Yes, that's actually a point, right? So as you notice from my uh, all these slides, I, I modify all these slides to represent all the things that are vector in bold, such that we can tell whether this is a single number or is a list of numbers. Okay. Therefore, here, I spell it with English, but I put it in bold anyway. So we start with these weights, all the weights equal zero. How many weights do we have? Question. How many weights do we have? So assuming that there are capital N features, we now move to the N plus one, where we are adding one more feature, which is a constant one for every feature. And then we're going to be having a additional weight uh, value, which allows us to move up and down the, uh, the line. So for each training instance, so for every X and Y, and therefore for every vector F computed out of the sample X, Classify with a current weight, right? So how do we do classification? We compute inner product. If it's positive, plus one. If it's negative, negative one. So basically, I do the I check. Oh well, you were doing inner product before, but now we actually can see, given that I have a vector and the bias term, I can see where the uh, hyperplane is. And so, given that I have this specific x, I check. Are you on the right side or on the left side of the uh, on the hyperplane? Then I can tell you, are you are you positive or you're negative? OK, cool. So if it is correct, my prediction is going to be the same as the uh, target. Cool. You you leave it. Uh, you leave it there. I'm looking for this guy over here. Where is this thing supposed to be? Is on the left side or on the right side? So I check. Uh, whether the inner product is equal or larger than zero. And then if it's equal or larger than zero, I'm going to say, okay, it's a plus. So if it is a plus and it happened to be on the left hand side, in this case of the decision boundary or on the decision boundary, all good. Now, if it is wrong, we just push the decision boundary such that it's going to be right again. If I get a negative sample over here, which happened to be on the wrong side of the decision boundary, I go and move the decision boundary. OK, how do we learn? I get a new sample. It is in the correct location. Cool. I don't do anything. It is in the wrong location. I go and move the decision boundary. I think it makes sense to me. OK, yes. OK, good. Let's actually look at the geometry of how this works. So again, we start with these weights equals zero. 
Of course, this weight is not equal to zero, but let's assume <laughs> this is my initial weight. So how do I do this classification? So we assume every feature should be true in the learning process. Given my input, I have a vector of features that are characterizing, describing my specific input, right? This specific input uh, email has one vector that is 2020 and there is an additional one at the beginning. This two thing has the pixel blah, 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 on and off. And then there is one loop and there is a bias here equal one. Alan, does it make sense what I'm saying? These are the features. Features are the descriptors of your data point. Alan, hold on, wait. Alan, are you there? <laughs> but why do we move the bias according to the feature? No, no, the, the bias here, once again, the bias in the feature is always equal one. Okay, and this is the, the bias term. The by the, every feature will get a additional plus one in their first location. The weight is the thing that we change, the thing that we are going to be trying to learn, the thing that we're going to be trying to recover from my set of data points. So these numbers I can change. These numbers I get from from your, my data set, from my collection of data points. We would like to find out how to draw this decision boundary such that I don't make mistakes. And I explained that we're gonna be basically getting a new sample. Is the sample on the right side of the of this bar pool? No, we don't do anything. It's on the wrong side of the bar. Then I start moving my bar and the bar is the the, the hyperplane defined by my vector, right? We saw it here. So my vector defined this bar. I can rotate this vector and I can move up and down the hyperplane by changing the bias. Got it, okay. Uh, how do we choose what features to use? That's a very good question. Ah, that's called feature selection. How do we find what features to use? That's how people used to get uh, their careers, <laughs> maybe back in the day. Uh, there were basically experts that were breaking their heads, trying to figure out how to extract the most meaningful features from the data. 2010, we completely throw out of the window that approach, and we are learning everything from data okay, most of the time. Uh, if you have a lot of data, we can learn the features direct from the data. Deep learning. Next week. Did I answer your question, Cheng? Yes. Okay. And then uh, I think we are trying to correctly categorize these systems. Mm, no. So this point here is that how do I figure out the weights that are making the least amount of mistakes? or no mistakes if the data uh, is actually linearly separable, right? We have some data points. I like to find the location that allows me to separate the two classes apart. So how do we start? We put a hyperplane somewhere, and then we start moving it if we do mistakes. If we don't do mistakes, if the hyperplane that we put at random works, done, finish. Now, if I start making mistakes, I start nudging this hyperplane in order to lower the number of mistakes, okay? I'm going to explain everything. Don't worry. This was just intuition. Now, mathematics. So no, don't worry if you, <laughs> you didn't get the intuition. OK, tell me if you don't get it. I will answer every possible doubt. We start with a arbitrary. OK, now we start with weight equals zero. In the drawing, of course, doesn't show weight equals zero. We can assume that it was zero before. Now we are in this situation. So I have my feature uh, vector f. Again, it's a function of x, but I don't care. I just consider just the feature myself. And I know if it is a, a good guy or a bad guy, right? If it is a spam or is a ham. The first point, right, from previous slide, we classify with the current weights. Okay, question. Does our perception consider this feature vector uh, as belonging to the positive class or the negative class? Positive, why? The explanation you had to explain. You cannot say you have fifty percent chance of getting the right answer. Tell me why. Inner products okay. If an, if in an angle less than ninety degrees, that's correct. Cool. 
Uh, all right, so we said that our prediction, our Y tilde, is going to be plus one if the inner product is equal or larger than zero. It's going to be negative one if it's lower than zero. Cool. Now, if it was correct, meaning if my prediction Y tilde is the same as the, uh, the, the label Y, then don't change anything. Otherwise, what do we do? We move the decision boundary. How we do that? I'll show you finally some mathematics. If wrong, adjust the weight vector by adding or subtracting the feature vector f. Subtract if y is the negative one. Hmm. So in mathematics, I can just write the following. w, the, the weight, gets, this is a getting function, gets, it's like the equality on a programming language, not equality in mathematics. So weight gets updated as weight plus my target times the feature. But with weight equals zero, isn't the that we are getting zero no matter what? Right? Yeah, there you go, right? So no matter what f is, uh, at the beginning, the model will output plus one. If it was correct, you still keep it at zero. If it was incorrect, tell me what happens. What is going to be your next weight value? Negative F. No, no, I did I was talking to Josh and damn, okay. <laughs> you stole the answer. Okay, fine. No, don't worry. Josh and does it make sense? Yes, okay, good. All right, I also have an interactive demo. Don't worry. Okay, so okay, I have many interactive demos. I spent so much time on this stuff. So here, in this case, what happened here? Can you can someone tell me what happened in the in the drawing? You don't need to know. I'm just trying to see whether you can figure out what just happened on the on the on the right hand side here. No, no one. <laughs> Uh, it should have been classified as minus one. That is correct. Uh, this one is a, a vector subtraction, right? If I have this ve uh, vector w and I want to sum uh, f, uh, you, you put the same vector on the end, and you would be summing those two things, and it becomes a vector like here. If you want to subtract a vector, you have to put the tip of the other vector. Uh, yeah. False positive. Every time you say these words, I have to think what they mean. False positive. Yes, it is correct. False positive. All right. So uh, if you want to subtract two vectors, you put the tip of the other vector on the tip of the other vector, right? I mean, and then you follow the, um, the other that other direction. Or if you want, you flip this vector, you put negative sign, and then you sum these two vectors, right? All right. So this is going to be y f where y is going to be negative one, obviously, because it's on the other sign. And then if I sum the two things, I'm going to get this new weight vector, which is kind of like a rotation, if you see, right? It kind of rotated my, my, my weight, right? And it kind of rotated this hyperplane now, right? So this thing allows me to rotate my hyperplane based on uh, uh, this sample. And now my red uh, feature the original one it's on the green side of the of the hyperplane which means it got classified as negative one right Let, let's look at this thing what is now the inner product between my new weight right and this feature so I just take this guy here as being my new weight, right? I'd like to do the next classification, let's say. I will, I'd like to reclassify, check what is the classification value my model assigns to this F, given that I change my weight, okay? So I do the inner product, but this uh, W transpose is going to be this new W, right? So this is my new W transposed F. So if I do the multiplication, I'm going to get the previous uh, weight transpose f, which was that uh, positive value, right? Which was the previous inner product. Plus, uh, what is this thing here? I have my, yeah, can you tell me? Can someone tell me what this is? What is this? Uh, a vector transpose itself.
We don't know. Yes, we know, right? That's the square norm of, uh, of F. And by definition, the square norm, it's a... Tell me more. It's a scalar that is correct, but there is some more positive number that, well, non-negative, right? Uh, actually, it's correct is positive because the, um, the bias is actually always one, right? So this is actually a positive number. You're correct, Raul. This is a positive number. Y is negative one. You can see here uh, that the Y flipped the sign of this vector. And so my the new inner product is going to be the previous inner product, basically, plus a negative number, right? Because of y, y is negative one. Yeah, it's less positive, right? Sweet. So this update, when you subtract F from W, it will always turn out the case that the new weight now I will, will have a lesser inner product than before. And so if before you were uh, misclassifying, now it's less likely that you're going to be misclassified, right? Again, depends on the intensity of this guy, right? It doesn't mean it's not going to be always the case, but it goes in the correct direction, right? It's going to be decrementing, in this case, the inner product. Okay. Questions until this part here. Uh, is everyone following this stuff? This is quite genius. I think so. Uh, I should actually sh show you the, um, uh, the original article. Okay, I show you one more animation, then I show you the original article, okay? Because I think it's pretty cool. And then maybe uh, in the when we're gonna talk, talking about a gradient based method, I may also show you where this formula can actually uh, come from, okay? But this was actually deceived uh, like by someone thinking very hard. <laughs> Okay, so the last last slide for today. I think by now you actually can solve the uh, the homework six now. So I will release again tonight because you have everything that is required to solve that homework. So we start with this thing. We start with some uh, initial sample. Ha! Huh. I think we skip a few steps, but we have this as the initial decision boundary. Okay. The weight should be either still be zero or the negative feature, right? As we said before, we have this decision boundary that get basically uh, updated every time he sees a new sample until he gets to the place where he actually stops. Okay, but again, at the beginning, he, he, he jumps a lot, right? He jumps a lot because you are summing vectors. But then after a bit, these vectors like uh, it turn out they. The, their effect can cancel each other, and it turns out you're gonna get this hyperplane uh, stabilizing in midway. So every F has at most two attributes. At 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 least, right? What do you mean at most? Most, least. There are different words. There is a bias, right? For every every uh, every feature. Uh, how can we represent? Oh, okay, sure. So the, the 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 things I'm showing you here on the screen are on two dimensions, such that you understand what's going on, and that's why we have a line separating things, right? But then, in a normal scenario, you're gonna have a feature vector of I don't know 128, uh, just a random number, <laughs> uh, elements, and then instead of having a line separating things. So you're going to be having these hyperplanes, uh, which is going to be 127th dimensional uh, boundary decision, right? Okay, so this is going to be working in a high, high dimensional space because every, every feature has multiple items. Okay, right? That, does it make sense? Okay, let me show you where the article is, the original article. All right, so this actually is the original article where this uh, perception comes from. Uh, so this was uh, written in 1943. Uh, if you're interested, you can check it out. You uh, NYU offer you uh, access to this uh, article, and you can see again it's, it's again just for interest, right? Historical interest. Everything you don't have to read this, uh, but it is you know um, interesting again from historical perspective. Anyway, so if you're interested, you can check out this thing. These are a neural diagram. These are the synapses I was telling you. These are the representation of neurons. Uh, there are some still some papers that are using these synapses. Uh, 
so there are even inhibitory and excitatory synapses. There is really, there is a lot of stuff uh, there. Anyway, so if you're interested in in the historical thing, check out the thing. Maybe just read the, the abstract. I'll release. Yeah. So the the homework uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. See, homework six is going to be about the naive base classification, accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 score. And then finally, to do some simple uh, classification of linear separable classes with a perception. Okay. So this is all. Uh, the three topics of the homework I'm going to be putting out, uh, I guess, later today. Questions before we say goodbye? No question one, no question two, no question three. All right, so I don't know where I will be mon on Monday because this office was given to me only for these two weeks. So I will have to find a new office <laughs> for next week. Otherwise, everything is fine. I see you uh, on Friday if you're coming uh, see me at the office uh, here at CDS. Otherwise, see you on Monday. Uh, enjoy your lunch and have a nice weekend. Okay. Bye-bye.